Hello, everyone. Welcome to the mental mental health, uh, men's health topic. Some of you guys might think that's the same thing, uh, but we're going to cover a couple things that some of what we've touched on a little bit, but some of it uh, is new and it's kind of just unique to men's health. It's not necessarily endocrinology uh, related per se, but it's some drugs that are commonly used that we haven't had a chance to go over yet. So let's talk quickly about androgens in general and testosterone and testosterone replacement therapy. So feedback loops, the way testosterone affects things. There's a lot of different players here. Here's your abbreviations to find um, and the negative feed or the positive and negative feedback loops that go on with um, testosterone. So basically, if we want to manipulate the hormone system uh, in the with with respect to the male endocrinology pathways, we can choose any number of methods. But uh, generally speaking, when it comes to uh, men's health that's directly re related to testosterone, whether it be deficiency or something like that, we're usually just going to replace the deficient hormone. There might be some manipulation when it comes to the um, other areas like uh, where you want to actually decrease the presence of testosterone or androgen activity, such as prostate cancer. So why? let's talk about testosterone or T replacement therapy. So low T is basically a cause of a couple different things. Um, it can be due to age, it can be due to some other uh, just abnormality going on. Um, so that's the first step I would ask. I think there's a controversy in the medical community about you know, if I have an older man who is naturally a little bit low in testosterone, but still may be considered to be normal for his age, should I replace it if he's having symptoms? Is that going to help? Is testosterone replacement kind of like the fountain of youth, giving an older man testosterone to make him feel younger again? Is that appropriate medically? Um, I'm not going to get into those details too much, but uh, we'll, we'll go down that pathway a little bit here. So basically, um, somebody with a low testosterone level, uh, hypogonadism uh, can cause decreased sperm production, decrease in T production, or delayed puberty. So those could be different age groups. Obviously, you know, you could have a young child who has um, hypogonadism who is not going into puberty like they would with the rest of their peers. And you could have a man who is trying to get pregnant, perhaps, or trying to get his partner pregnant, perhaps, and has um, low sperm production. So it can affect fertility, of course, as well. So there are some other obvious medical things there. Um, but sometimes they just replace it uh, for the sake of having a low testosterone level that might help with other things too. And those aren't like depression or mood and things like that. That's not as well studied. So we'll get into that a little bit. But basically testosterone replacement is very simple for its mechanism. You're literally replacing testosterone. We aren't using really any analogs. Um, there are some analogs on the market that exist. Well, they're kind of sketchy. Some of them are more, more black market-ish, but there are a couple that are approved. Just We rarely ever use synthetic testosterone, mostly just using regular because it, it works fine that way. And that way we don't have to really manipulate it. You can kind of replace it like you would the natural hormone, or it's going to replace exactly like the natural hormone. And um, <clears throat> it's going to work uh, within those pathways like the endogenous hormone would. So testosterone levels in males, usually it's going to depend on where they're at in age. So for example, um, 12 to 13 years, usually less than 800 uh, nanograms per deciliter, 14 years uh, approaching puberty there. So you're going to up your, and, but you can still have males who haven't quite gotten a spike in testosterone yet. So that's why it's greater than 15 to 16 years. The range could vary substantially. And this is where you'd get into more, um, you know, on the low end of the range would probably be those males who have maybe some delayed puberty. Uh, generally speaking, you're going to probably see a much higher uh, level of testosterone. And then you can see that as age progresses, you have a really large range. So even for an 18 year old or 20 year old guy, you could see between 300 and 1000 uh, nanograms per deciliter. So that's a big range of testosterone that's all considered normal. So really, as long as you meet somewhere in this in this range, you should be having the same effects of the hormone as somebody who maybe is on the higher end. Now, granted, there's going to be some differences there, right? But certainly there isn't a lot of evidence that says, like, for example, if you have somebody who has 400 nanograms per deciliter, bumping them up to, you know, 800 nanograms per deciliter, if there's a big impact there on their overall well-being. And that's, again, where the, some of the controversy comes in. Um, and then over 40, you can even have still pretty high levels in the later years of life for men. So again, really big range and difference uh, in, uh, in what's considered normal. And you will see this trickle down a little bit as men age, but still 
not huge differences between, you know, again, the 20s and 30s, perhaps, and then even a 40-year-old male with respect to what's considered normal. Free testosterone is another thing that could be measured if you thought there might be some issue with protein binding or things like that, uh, and then you can do a different level for that. And that might give you a more active picture as to what is available for the male. So maybe they have a really high testosterone level, but you're seeing some symptoms that coincide with low testosterone and you could do a three level and maybe for some reason they don't have a high free level, but they have a normal regular level. So that's always another lab test you could do. All right, clinical benefits. So why do we do this? Virility, um, normalizing reproductive capability is probably the biggest one. So if somebody has, if a couple's having a hard time getting pregnant and if they do some testing and find out the man has low sperm count and then they find out he has low testosterone, they could increase that way. So it's a pretty standard reduction that can still usually uh, be a pretty quick fix in some cases. That's a pretty easy thing you can find on laboratory uh, findings and it makes uh, makes it easier if a couple's trying to get pregnant if that is the cause because that's a pretty, again, easy way we can pharmacologically manipulate to replace the testosterone and that should help correct the, virility, the fertility issues. Muscle mass increase. So this is obviously the biggest abuse of testosterone and it's one of the things where androgen, e either plain testosterone or testosterone analogs are abused rampantly for this. Now, if you have an older person or a cachectic male, so maybe somebody who is perhaps undergoing chemotherapy or has chronic HIV. Actually, you see this a lot. I feel like with older men with HIV, I see them on testosterone quite a bit. Um, when I interview them at the hospital, I don't know if that's coincidence or just part of the, the therapies they were on at some point in their life. But it isn't uncommon for people in that uh, category to use testosterone for the, for the medical reason of increasing muscle mass and, um, and not kind of wasting uh, muscle mass like they might otherwise do to their diseases. Bone density increase, this is something that can be done. Now, if somebody's testosterone is normal, probably not going to have a huge effect. But again, we're talking about people with low testosterone here. Um, psych effects, they've done a lot of studies for people with borderline low or low testosterone. And mood is really inconsistent data. So if somebody has subclinical depression and they also have low testosterone, there's some positive correlations that replacing testosterone does have an effect on mood, a positive effect on mood. Cognition, it's been studied in... Alzheimer's patients, so male Alzheimer's patients, to see if increasing testosterone levels has any improvement on memory, and it's not been shown to be helpful. Delayed puberty, so if you have a boy who hasn't gone into puberty, the, what's considered delayed puberty is secondary sex characteristics that are absent by the age when 95% of their peers would have initiated sexual maturation. So we're looking at the 5% group that haven't quite gotten um, their secondary sex characteristics like their peers would, and that would be considered delayed puberty. Therefore, uh, they might qualify for a testosterone replacement. Aging men, uh, sexual dysfunction, depression, mood, those are all things that I think testosterone is used for pretty regularly, and whether or not there's good evidence, there there isn't. Um, sexual dysfunction, maybe, but again, it, it, it all depends on what your levels are, right? If you're an older man and you're kind of falling the lower end of what's normal, is testosterone replacement help going to really help if you bump it up to, you know, uh, if, again, if you're going from like 400 to 800, that's all within normal range, but is that really going to make a difference? That's where we're lacking in studies, and there's a lot of controversy around that. Uh, just testosterone's effects on, on the male body. Talked about some of these already. <clears throat> so as far as products go, again, when we're talking about medical uses of testosterone, we're talking about just replacing T. We aren't using any synthetic androgens, really. There's a couple different pathways uh, pharmacologically we can use. The only thing we don't do with testosterone is oral. So there's not really a good oral bioavailable form of testosterone. There's been some analogs developed, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of this lecture when I talk about male birth control. But as far as topical products go, you have gels, creams, patches, and axillary sprays. Uh, it's not a spray, actually. It's kind of like a, a gel application thing. But they're all different absorption transdermally. It's not really any different. The, the difference is, is what people consider to be convenient. So, for example, Androgel comes in this convenient pump. You do like one or two pumps. It measures out the exact dose for you. And then you apply that in some certain areas. And this Axion, which is the axillary application, comes with a deodorant stick looking thing. And it's supposed to mimic the, the concept of putting on deodorant. 
Um, you would want to apply this prior to putting on deodorant um, so that, and then wait for it to absorb a certain amount of time. I can't remember if it's like five minutes or what it is, but it is some, some specified length of time. There are injectable products, so we don't give t testosterone IV. There's just really no reason to do it, but you can give a couple in injectable uh forms. One is a depot shot, which is kind of like an oil-based substance that's going to create a depot. Usually it's given in the gluteal muscle. And then you also have the IM uh, pellet, which is, well, IM is probably a, a bad way to describe it, but it's an implantable pellet and usually goes right on the top of the gluteal muscle, kind of where it meets the back here. And it will get implanted. It's Again, you can see the size here. It's about, you know, not quite the diameter of a dime, so it's pretty small. And that's got a slow release mechanism too. So two options you can try here that are a little bit different than applying something uh, topically every day or using a patch. Some issues with testosterone contact, careful with children and women. So there's been some case reports of men who apply it transdermally and then they might come in contact with somebody or maybe you pick up your kid and hug them and then they wipe it and they get it on their skin. So making sure that you are letting it absorb fully before coming in contact with somebody and making sure that you're covering or covering it with like a shirt or something if you're applying it on your shoulder, which is where most people put it in. Um, problems, usually really well tolerated. Most of it has to do with overcorrection or either abuse of testosterone and whether that abuse is inadvertent or not. Um, either way, it's causing too much testosterone to build. So uh, dermatologic acne, hyperhidrosis are common side effects. Um, CNS, irritability, aggression, you think of like roid rage, right? Um, too much testosterone. Uh, endocrine, increased estradiol, gynecomastia, and hirsutism can all cause this. Uh, it could be caused by increases in serum concentration of testosterone due to in interfering with your body's natural feedback loops. GI side effects, diarrhea, GERD, uh, GU, prostate-specific antigen increase. There's not necessarily a correlation between uh, prostate cancer and chronic testosterone replacement that I know of that's solid, but there is some interesting data that says that people who have higher testosterone or replaced testosterone might have higher rates of um, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, it might accelerate BPH potentially. That's, a, that's one risk that people think is, is associated with testosterone replacement. Hepatic abnormal LFTs, cholestasis, necrosis, uh, rare. Um, hepatic toxicity is one of the biggest ones that comes up with testosterone replacement, and it usually has to do with, again, overcorrection or abuse. Renal, uh, increased serum creatinine, polyuria, respiratory, upper respiratory infection, bronchitis. So there's a lot of things associated with them, but think again, think about this as a spectrum. Normal use, um, controlled levels, probably not going to see a lot of this, maybe the dermatologic and the CNS stuff, but your body might get used to that over time, get used to the higher levels, and you might see that start to fade. And then some of this other stuff you're probably going to see as you push that level higher with um, more aggressive therapy. Okay, uh, BPH, so benign prosthetic hyperplasia is inevitable for men as they age. Basically, any guy's prostate is going to increase as they get older. It's benign, again, this is separate from prostate cancer. Um, DHT is the mediator of prostate growth, and it's a 10 times more potent androgen than testosterone. And what happens is you get difficulty urinating. So as any older man will tell you, they don't urinate as well. I feel like older men like to say this a lot, like, oh, I don't urinate as well as I used to. And uh, it's just because of age, and it's just going to happen. There's some people it'll happen to more aggressively. Other people will have to maybe get surgical interventions. Some people will take drugs. Some people might not have enough effects to really matter. But every male is going to experience this at some point in their life hopefully in the older years, but you never know, it might start earlier for some people. And again, preven prevalence of benign or BPH uh, with age, uh, per this study, it was published in Journal of Neurology in 84, so it's kind of old, but I think the data hasn't changed a whole lot. You basically get to pretty close to 100% with age. Now, not quite, so there's going to be maybe 5 to 10% of the population that might not ever have symptoms, but they might have symptoms and just not report them. So it's, it's pretty much every guy. I think you can safely say that the vast majority of men will experience some symptoms of this as they age. All right, so we have a couple different drugs, and I think this graphic shows nicely where they all work. So um, I'd refer back to this as we talk about them. But you have uh, some of the primary treatments here. So muscarinic receptors are located on the bladder. So we can manipulate cholinergic activity to um, 
help the bladder void better. Uh, anti or sorry, alpha adrenergic receptors. There's alpha receptors both in the prostate and on the bladder. And there is uh, something called five alpha reductase enzymes, which has to do more with how the hormone side of things manipulates it. So that helps has to do with uh, a separate mechanism, um, separate from the manipulation of the muscle and the vasculature. So think about muscarinic activity and, and anti alpha adrenergic activity is you're causing some sort of either muscle contraction or vasodilation or something to do with that. You're focusing more on the mechanical side of things, whereas the 5-alpha reductase enzyme drugs, which we'll talk about here in a second, have more to do with the actual hormonal side. And then you have phosphodiesterase enzymes. So PDE5 inhibitors are drugs that were pioneered for erectile dysfunction, so like sildenafil or Viagra or Cialis. And they've actually been shown that this is pretty effective for uh, BPH as well. And you'll actually see Cialis marketed as a once daily treatment, not only for it works great for a BPH, but it also works for your erectile dysfunction too. So it's kind of like a, a double indication drug that way. Uh, but that works also on the bladder, the, uh, the prostate, and with some pr promoting some vasculature uh, improvements in blood flow to the area, which can help with urination as well. So there's a couple different mechanisms here and we'll talk about how we use them together. Alpha agonist, oh, sorry, alpha one antagonists, excuse me, so alpha blockers have been used probably for the longest time for BPH. There's a, a, examples of here. If you remember OSIN, you'll remember all the alpha antagonists. <clears throat> Some of these we talked about with respect to hypertension back in the fall, so terazosin, doxazosin are more, are, sorry, are less specific alpha blockers, and they're going to be more broadly applicable to things like hypertension, whereas tamsulosin and beyond, so tamsulosin, alfuzosin, and psilotosin are very specific for alpha receptors on the bladder neck and the prostate itself. So therefore, you aren't going to see as much orthostatic hypotension, but um, basically it depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to treat an older male who also has hypertension and BPH, Doxazosin is probably the best choice. Terazosin is a little bit too nonspecific for my personal taste. Doxazosin also has a bitter, but a bit, uh, sorry, a bit of a better dosing strategy, meaning it's, I think it's like twice a day. Terazosin is more frequent than that, like TID. Um, these drugs are pretty convenient. They're usually taken once daily, and again, you don't really have much hypertension effect, uh, hypotensive uh, uh, side effects with these. You might get a little bit at higher doses, but it's pretty rare. So very well tolerated medications. Uh, Tamsulosin is brand name Flomax. So I didn't put the brand names in here. Um, I can't remember these ones brand names, but that's probably the most common one that people have heard of that's been on the market for quite a while. It is generic now, so it's a cheap option that is selective. For a while, the generic line basically was drawn in here. So we didn't have anything on this side of the coin on the selective side that was generic. So they were all expensive. So some people were taking the less selective agents because of cost, and then they're getting more orthostatic hypotension. Well, in any case, um, Tamsulosin is generic now, so it offers an affordable alternative for people who uh, don't want that hypotensive effect. But again, if you want to add to somebody's antihypertensive regimen, doxazosin has good synergy with both BPH treatment and antihypertensive effects. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So these are the drugs we talked about that have some manipulation on the hormones, and they're only ones that actually work on the hormonal side of things for BPH. So finasteride and dutasteride are the two drugs here. Uh, finasteride is known mostly as Proscar. You might have heard of Propecia as well. Propecia is a smaller dose finasteride that is approved for male pattern baldness. And the reason is, is because, uh, so let's talk about the mechanism. Basically, 5-alpha reductase is an enzyme that helps convert testosterone to DHT. And by inhibiting it, we prevent that conversion rate as effectively. So basically you're decreasing your TH, or DHT levels. DHT not only contributes to BPH, it also contributes to male pattern baldness. So um, for people with, uh, so they, they discovered that you don't need quite as high of a dose um, for the um, BPH versus uh, male pattern baldness. So it's like five milligrams a day for Proscar and one milligram a day for Propecia. Uh, Dutasteride is a newer drug that's brand name Avidart, and it works similarly. I think the side effect profile might be slightly better than, uh, than with finasteride. Major side effects for most men are going to be decreased libido and erectile dysfunction. Those are going to be the ones that people probably complain about the most. There are a few other ones, but these are probably the most common ones. And that just has to do with manipulating 
your androgens, right? You're, you're not getting as much of this super potent DHT that, that lurks around in your system and, and does help with some of this type of stuff. So if you don't have that as frequently, you might experience this. But the side effects are, are rarer. It's not like everyone gets them, but it is one of the more common reported, like maybe with Propecia, lower dose, probably 5%-ish. And then with ProScar, higher, maybe 20% or something like that. So it can be pretty pretty significant for some patients, certainly. So how do we use these drugs, and is there one that's preferred over another? Mild to moderate symptoms, the alpha blockers are usually preferred. Remember the more selective agents? So again, Tamsulosin, probably the preferred agent here. That's going to have minimal side effects, and it's going to be highly effective. The reason is, is because when you add on something like an 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, once you start manipulating the hormones, you end up with more side effects. So for mild to moderate, early BPH, alpha blockers alone should be very effective therapy and, again, have minimal side effect or profile, minimal side effect profile. Uh, for more severe symptoms with large prostates, um, initially on presentation, or if you tried an alpha blocker and you've maxed out your dose and you aren't getting response you need, what you can do is add on that 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So you usually keep the alpha blocker go going even if the response isn't great because the idea is that once that DHT decreases, your prostate might shrink and then the alpha blocker has more chance to work effectively. So you'd keep it going at the same time. Other considerations, anti-muscarinic drugs, I didn't really talk about these. Um, tolteridine is one that's used in this area. Think about them kind of like the bladder spasm agents we talked about for incontinence. Um, they, they would be sort of a third line option. And then the PDE5 inhibitors. Currently, those are not preferred over these, but as we see drugs like Cialis getting marketed more aggressively for this, Cialis has a long half-life, so it's good for once daily, whereas like Viagra has a pretty short half-life, um, and it wouldn't be as effective. You'd have to take it like three times a day. So now that we have a drug that's once daily as a PDE5 inhibitor that's been shown to work for this, we might see that more commonly. Um, I think if you would ask me five years ago if that was something that was used, I would probably say, what, people take Cialis daily for BPH? And now it's actually quite a bit more common and not, not unheard of at all. And certainly Cialis is marketing, marketing that as well. So you have that push going on. So I don't know if we'll see that change at all, but for now this is pretty much the standard approach. I would say if you're picking a third line, I would probably lean towards the PDE5 inhibitor versus the anti-muscarinic just because the side effects are probably a little bit better with these, but you know, either way would be fine for most patients. All right, let's talk quickly about prostate cancer. Um, most common cancer for men. Early diagnosis is key to survival. It's usually got slow tumor growth and um, slow metastatic spread. So again, if you find it easy, quickly, um, then you can probably do some sort of immediate intervention that prevents the tumor from growing. So <clears throat> usually there's a couple things we look at. So prostate-specific antigen is a diagnostic tool, and there are certain age markers, and I can't remember what they are. I'm sure you learn about it in other classes, but when you check for PSA, it gives you uh, your diagnostic tool. However, high PSA isn't always associated with cancer. Some people might have a high PSA that's just there and they don't actually have cancer. Uh, but it is something that at least would give you uh, a preliminary suggestion that you would have to do more advanced, advanced screening. Um, digital rectal exam to actually feel the prostate is uh, a tried and true method. So basically you're feeling if the prostate feels normal, if it's enlarged, if it feels like a tumor. Um, certainly, I don't know what that feels like or what that is uh, as far as an exam goes, so I'll leave that up to your more advanced clinical exam type people, but uh, that is one way you can check as well. Um, the one thing I will say as well, BPH is not cancer and cannot lead to cancer. However, you can have a patient who has BPH and prostate cancer at the same time. So they are, they're exclusive of each other, but they can happen together, if that makes sense. Um, prostate cancer is more common in older men, especially men over 50. Treatment options, andoreceptor antagonists, aka antiandrogens. There's two drugs here, flutamide and bicalutamide. They inhibit androgen uptake and binding at the target tissues. Um, cytochrome P450-17 inhibitor. This specific enzyme is responsible for androgen biosynthesis, and it inhibits formation of... So by inhibiting this, we inhibit the formation of testosterone precursors. There's a drug called abit. Uh, a biraterone or Zytiga, which is a tablet that costs about $130 a day. So that's an option, a newer drug, <clears throat> expensive, but uh, a separate mechanism that's kind of unique. There are GNRH, LH analogs, and 
an agonist that can work. Basically, this causes medical castration by suppressing testicular steroid genesis. Um, so lupulide, luprolide or lupron and gozerelin are two of the examples. Luprolide is a really common one that's an injectable um, long-acting medication that a lot of times people will get in conjunction with prostate cancer treatment. So they might do some lupron dosing before surgery and after surgery, or depending on what it is. Uh, but that's a really common intervention that uh, they make uh, from a pharmacological standpoint. This just shows where the drugs work. All right, that's all I really want you to know about prostate cancer. Again, similar to breast cancer, just understand the drugs. If you can recognize, you know, what an androgen receptor antagonist is, what a GnRH LH um, agonist, and which drugs are used kind of for, to medically castrate somebody, and the SIP. 17 inhibitor. There's only a couple drugs to know there, and so um, they might show up on the exam, but they're going to be basic questions about, you know, which one of these is used for prostate cancer, or maybe a mechanism of action type question. All right, erectile dysfunction. A uh, really common thing that you'll see in primary care, if that's what you go into, it's about 18.4% of men 20 or older have reported erectile dysfunction at some point. There is a screening tool that uh, exists out there. It's like a questionnaire um, that scores people, and then that will determine how severe they are. Uh, I don't have it here, and I'm not super familiar with it. I just know that it exists. Um, CV disease and diabetes increase prevalence to 50%. So we think about anything that affects blood flow. So cardiovascular disease and diabetes obviously affecting blood flow. That can be a big sign that somebody, or erectile dysfunction can be a big sign that somebody has something else going on. So let's say an older man comes, or any man, um, comes into your office, complains of erectile dysfunction, wants Viagra, wants you to just write a script, and you're like, wait a second, let's look at some other things. You do some blood sugar testing, you check their blood pressure, and sure enough, they have some prehypertension and prediabetes, or maybe full-on diabetes going on too. So again, very common comorbidity with those two diseases. Um, BPH also, and I put hypertension, which I would qualify as CV disease, but BPH also has a higher prevalence of men with erectile dysfunction who have that disease versus versus uh, non-BPH men. So that's something that could be associated with age as well, perhaps, or perhaps, but still something to consider. Um, decreased libido can cause erectile dysfunction, and 5 to 15% of men at any time could maybe have this uh, comor comorbid thing going on. It increases with age. Um, other common causes in treatment, psychological is probably the most challenging one. If you think about people who have uh, anxiety or what, what it's like to have an anxiety attack, you get a flood of sympathetic nervous system activity. And what does norepinephrine cause? Vasoconstriction. So if somebody's having a lot of anxiety, um, it might just be difficult for them to physically get more blood into their penis so they can't get an erection. And that's now something you'd have to tease out as far as a diagnostic. So you, is it purely psychological? Is this something we have to address on the psych side of things? Or is there some kind of a physical cause? And you should be able to determine that based on, again, screening for some of this stuff. Um, age, I think, would be a big consideration. You know, younger men probably more likely to be on the psychological side versus the physical side, but you don't know for sure. If somebody has low testosterone, which can definitely be a source of decreased libido, that would be a testosterone treatment. Um, and then we talked about SSRIs and their heavy side effect being decreased libido and erectile dysfunction in men. So that would be something where you'd either add an adjunct therapy, so we talked about bupropion being a good choice for that. The other thing is uh, considering switching. So switching to an SNRI, which don't have that side effect as prevalently, or something like mirtazapine, which is uh, not associated with, with decreased libido or erectile dysfunction. Okay, so let's say you've ruled some of that out. You still want to go ahead and treat erectile dysfunction. Um, underlying Etiology, we kind of talked about that stuff already. Weight loss, smoking cessation, some of that stuff can help too. Uh, so if the cause is physical, a medical therapy is pretty straightforward. Um, we talked about some of the side, side, side effects of psych medications, but alpha blockers, think about an alpha antagonist, can cause possible erectile dysfunction. Uh, beta blockers, uh, thiazide diuretics, clonidine, spironolactone. Although alpha blockers, interestingly, I'll just point out, while they do actually have incidence reports of erectile dysfunction, there are some studies that show that they can help too because they're decreasing vasoconstrictive properties. So if you block alpha receptors in the male genitals, you can hopefully keep those vessels open a little bit more. So there is actually some studies that show that they do help with erectile dysfunction in addition to maybe causing it in some men. Beta blockers are kind of notorious. Uh, thiazide, diuretics, clonidine, spironolactone, a lot of antihypertensives here. 
Uh, if it's psychological, we talked about that already. There's uh, obviously some psych concerns, premature ejaculation, delayed ejaculation. Is there something going on sexually that's bothering the person? That would be something to address too. And then um, they have shown that even though some antidepressants or anxiolytic medications can cause erectile dysfunction, they can help with the anxiety component and therefore relieve the psychological concern. So you got it's a bit of a catch-22 there, but it is an option. All right, PDE5 inhibitors. So phosphodiesterase 5 um, <clears throat> is the enzyme we're inhibiting here. The mechanism does not cause erection. So it's not like you take a, a Viagra pill and you suddenly get an erection. Um, augments your natural response to sexual stimulation. So the way this works, here's sildenafil, which again is a generic name for Viagra. So what happens is um, when you are sexually aroused, your body releases nitric oxide, which causes a downstream effect, including um, cyclic GMP, uh, which causes a reduced, reduced concentration of calcium, smooth muscle relaxation, which gives you increased inflow of blood into the penis, which causes an erection. Now, phosphodiesterase 5 is responsible for breaking down cyclic GMP. So for most men during sexual arousal and stimulation, this process carries on fine. And even though you're breaking down some of the cyclic GMP, you aren't doing it enough to cause a decrease in erectile response response. Now, for other men, if we manipulate this system by blocking the PDE5 enzyme, you get an accumulation of cyclic GMP, and therefore you get a much more sustained effect here. And then uh, you end up with a easier, basically an easier ability to get an erection. You still have to have some sort of sexual stimulation involved though. So again, it's not, I want to make it clear that you, this isn't just cause somebody to have an erection, it just makes it easier to get an erection and have an erection sustained. All right, three drugs here, uh, sildenafil, vardenafil, and tadalafil. And differences, really the one I want you to know, the biggest difference between the three drugs is tadalafil's half-life. So tadalafil is Cialis and it lasts 36 hours. The other ones are very short duration. Um, sildenafil is thought of as probably the most potent one. So you kind of have to take the bad with the good, right? Sildenafil is highly potent, but you have a shorter window of activity to use it. Um, tadalafil, you could take it, you know, if you thought you were might going to have sex that evening, you could take it in the morning and still have plenty in your systemic circulation um, to carry through to the evening. Or I think they even advertised it at one point as kind of like the weekend drug. You could take it Friday night and be good until Sunday morning. Uh, interesting um, differences in kinetics. So Denafil, you would have to time it, and Vardenafil as well. Vardenafil is a slightly less potent version. It's not as common. Libitra is the brand name of that. Some other things about these meds. Um, I don't know if I really care. You know much more of this. Uh, to do so, you have some different metabolism pathways, but fairly similar. Very few contraindications. Um, nitrates. So if you use a nitrate for angina that's contraindicated to use it so with sildenafil and vardenafil we say no use of these within 24 hours of nitrate use tadalafil probably more like 48 hours due to its much longer half-life and activity uh, warnings precautions are pretty similar for a lot of these uh, sildenafil has quite a few more uh, with respect to some of the more cardiovascular things but they all really work the same so i'd say the warnings and precautions should be similar across the board um, sildenafil doesn't seem to have any hepatic issues, though, whereas vardenafil and tadalafil can have some more hepatic and uh, possible, like, for example, the urine excretion is 35% here, a little bit higher than the other two, so renal impact could be substantial. But again, we don't really care about that. Usually people are taking these once. They aren't taking them regularly, so accumulation is, is very low, uh, low risks for even an older male who might have some renal dysfunction. Uh, pricing, this is approximate, but this is still pretty accurate, and in fact, it's actually gone up a lot from this. So uh, we'll talk about that in a second here, but I'll get into the pricing. Uh, if I don't remember, hopefully I'll give myself a mental note right now. Um, comparison trials, so sildenafil versus tadalafil, there's a trial of open-label crossover. 71% of men preferred tadalafil, interestingly enough. There's minimal differences in outcomes overall. People preferred it because of its convenience, right? You have a drug that you can take whenever and be have it in your system for quite a long time, whereas sildenafil you have to plan much more so in advance. Side effects. So problems with these drugs. Uh, common is flushing, headaches, dizziness, sinus congestion, acid reflux has to do with the blood flow aspect of it. Uh, PD-5 um, will also affect blood flow in other areas, which is going to make sense with some of this stuff. <clears throat> Hypotension. 
And we talked about the nitrate use contraindication um, with alpha blockers. And again, I was talking about that some, some studies will show that alpha blockers can have a synergistic effect. It can also have a synergistic effect at dropping blood pressure too. So that's something to be careful with. Um, visual, uh, blue vision is common with sildenafil actually. Well, relatively common, it resolves in two to three hours. There's a, a lot of, I don't know if it's a common knowledge type thing or not, but Viagra took some heat because they there are some episodes of blindness, blindness, excuse me, and Tadalafil also had the same thing happen. Estimated about two to ten patients per a hundred thousand, which is extremely low. Very rare, but it is thought to be linked to those drugs for some reason. Something has to do with the way it affects the um, the optic blood flow possibly is, is the proposed mechanism, but I'm not 100% sure why Viagra causes blue vision. I don't know. Is it because the pill's really blue and the dye gets into your eyes? I, I don't know. That's, I just made that up. Don't, don't write that down. Um, <laughs> hearing. So um, I'll report rare hearing loss. Again, kind of similar to blindness. Uh, very rare. Myalgias, actually very common with Tadalafil only. Like 5 to 15% of people will get really bad lower or like usually lower back pain with uh, Cialis. And priapism, of course, these medications have the potential to overwork a little bit and cause a increase in erection. Um, there's reports of men who have gotten erections and their erection just doesn't ever go away. So um, treating it, you can use aspirin, uh, phenylephrine injections directly to the penis. You can use oral pseudoephedrine. Remember, pseudoephedrine uh, vasoconstrictive, has vasoconstrictive properties. So um, the pseudoephedrine uh, is an option that somebody could take at home or buy at a drugstore. Obviously, you probably don't don't want to go out to Walgreens with an erection. But maybe you have somebody you can send for you. Um, but pseudoephedrine, if you take it at a higher dose, I think the recommended dose is like taking, I don't know, three or four 30 milligram tablets to get uh, the effect. And that might be enough to do it. Other aspects, you can try and divert blood flow. So um, I've heard recommendations like walk up and down stairs, use large muscle groups and see if like exercising the muscles will divert blood flow from your penis to other parts of the body that can help with the erection. Uh, consider shorter half-lives initially. So if somebody is going to trial one of these, you might want to recommend starting with a, a Viagra or Levitra. Oh, this is the other drug, Avanafil, Stendra. It doesn't really have any advantage over the other ones, so I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot. But um, you might want to try one of the shorter acting ones just to see how somebody responds to them beforehand. Somebody might like the effect of it or find that it works for them. Other people might find it, it makes them uncomfortable or it worked too well. That might help you dial in the dose. If you give somebody a, a dose of Cialis and it's way too much initially, you could end up with a situation like a priapism. Um, <clears throat> and then that's going to last for a lot longer than Viagra, which leaves their system quite a bit faster. So just something to consider. Certainly there's advantages to the Cialis and go in, and I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't start there, but you might want to try a shorter acting one as a trial before you'd go uh, with something longer acting. Okay, other fun facts. Okay, good. I have cost here. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one to talk about, but um, sildenafil is the oldest and most well studied. I think everyone on the planet probably knows the name Viagra. Um, sildenafil is often abused. It can cause a, a reduction in post eject ejaculatory refractory time. So even for guys who don't really have any issue getting or maintaining erections, sometimes people will abuse it just for the sustained sexual effects it might have. Uh, it's quite expensive. So it's about $1,950 for a 30 day supply currently. Uh, that mean you're taking it every day, which most people probably don't have sex every day or need it every day, but you know, that would be, assume that's the case. Um, I recommend not telling your patients to buy things online if they can't afford it. So PD-5 inhibitors are probably the most commonly counterfeited medications on the planet. Well, maybe opioids, but anyway, PD-5 inhibitors are probably right up there. You know, you, this is something that somebody posted, one of my friends posted from Facebook, a <laughs> little bit inappropriate, uh, but you've got this like Viagra guy here, uh, and he's pointing you to the drugstore where you can buy Viagra, Cialis, and of course you can get your Z-Pack and Amoxicillin and, and Prozac. Wow, you can get lots of great stuff here. So anyway, you can uh, treat your syphilis uh, or your, <laughs> your infection while well, you get your extra um, uh, PDE5 inhibitors to keep you going. So you see like um, places where they don't have as quite as strict regulations on what pharmacies can sell, selling stuff like this over the counter. And, and who knows if it's, if it's real. It might look real. You might look at the packaging and be like, wow, that looks pretty real. But it's not that hard to make packaging look real. So just remember that. It's not that hard to make a blue pill that's shaped like a diamond that says Pfizer on it. 
uh, that's not hard to do either. So um, it's not hard to make a counterfeit look good. And uh, just because it looks right doesn't mean it's real. And the, the issue is you could take it and get some sort of really odd side effects. And you might maybe, what if the dose is five times what it is or Best case, best case scenario, you know, you're dealing with a placebo. If it's a counterfeit and nothing happens, uh, worst case scenario, you could be having some adulterated compound and get really nasty side effects from it. All right, what about cost alternatives? So some cheaper options for patients. This is always something I think worth talking about just because these drugs are so commonly sought out, I think, and commonly used. And what, what can you do for cost? So Tadalafil comes as a 5 milligram daily dose. So the, the highest dose Tadalafil is a 20 milligram tablet. And if you do the five milligram one, that's the BPH dosing once a day, but it also would work for erectile dysfunction too. It's about $10 per dose. So that's a cheaper tablet. Sildenafil comes as a 20 milligram generic product. And the reason why, so this is a little, little bit complicated. So Viagra itself is not generic. None of these drugs are generic. There's, the, there's a um, thought that Viagra will likely go generic probably in the next year. It's been on patent for longer than I can remember. Um, it's been on patent since I worked in pharmacy um, as in high school. Uh, it was on patent and uh, that's when I was a pharmacy tech and it's one of the only drugs I can think of that I remember seeing as a brand name on the shelf that's still brand name now. Uh, Viagra got in some legal, there was some legal thing that went on where somebody was trying to make a generic alternative and they got sued by Pfizer, which gave them a patent extension. Anyway, long story short, um, Viagra is not generic. However, when the Pfizer created the product Revadio, if you might remember that from when we talked about pulmonary hypertension, that's also sildenafil. And Tadalafil comes as a pulmonary hypertension med as well called Ad Circa. So different brand names. And Sildenafil, the Revadio form, was 20 milligrams, and that is actually generic now. So Revadio is generic, which is Sildenafil 20 milligrams. Still expensive generally, though. It's about $20 per dose, which, you know, if you, if you look at Viagra tablets, 100 milligrams to 50 milligrams is what a lot of people will take at a time. So you're looking at maybe you know, three to five tablets of this. But for somebody who can get by on a lower dose, um, who doesn't need, you know, the full dose maybe to get the effects from it. So then I felt 20 milligrams can be actually pretty, pretty good. Um, this is a side, this is a side story. So um, <laughs> I don't know if I should admit this or not that I know this, but I um, was, my wife for, for my Christmas present got me this um, sample box where you get like, I don't know, like men's grooming products, like shampoos and stuff. Anyway, it's kind of cool, but that's beside the point. She, one of the things they sent me were these like gummy multivitamins from some company that I never heard of. And they tasted really good. And I was like looking at, it's mostly just biotin, but I went on their website just to see like what, what else they make. Cause I'd never heard of them. And I found that that company actually markets a bunch of different men's related products and they sell not only vitamins and other things like that, but they sell uh, prescription products somehow. So like, for example, you could buy finasteride at one milligram doses. And basically I think you fill out an online questionnaire and they send you a bottle of it. And they were also selling Sildenafil 20 milligrams, which I thought was interesting. I'd never seen an online company that seemed like a legitimate company, not like a sketchy website. Um, and I clicked through some of the buttons on, on both the finasteride and the Sildenafil just to see, cause I was really curious what the uh, effects or what the, um, what the legal repercussions would be, or if they would have some sort of like, you have to call your physician or you have to call our physician. Or like, how do they even get around this legally? And ultimately I got to a point where it asked me what state I lived in and um, it said Minnesota does not allow this or something like that. So it must be a state law that allows people to sell prescriptions over the counter without, or prescription products via internet with minimal physician oversight. So again, I don't know how that works exactly, but I just thought I'd share that because I thought it was interesting. Anyway, learn something new every day. So what if your PDE5 inhibitors don't work? You can try a vacuum erection device. So you can get these with a prescription. They're, I don't know if people still use them. I remember at the pharmacy I worked at in high school, there was one on the back shelf and I was just like, what is this thing? And finally, I, of course, I had no idea. And so I asked the pharmacist and she awkwardly explained it to me. I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't have even bothered. Uh, but it was really old. It looked like it was created in like the 80s. It, it was really dusty. And I just, I don't think anyone, I never saw it leave the pharmacy. It was there when I started and there when I left. So I don't know. I don't know if people use them or not, but it is a it is a product that exists. There's probably non-prescription versions of them out there too. I don't imagine there's a, a prescription patent on a, a plastic tube with a pump attached to it. That's basically what it is. Um, intercavernous injectables. So when I worked at a, a 
pharmacy that specialized more in compounding actually made some of these. Um, we had a, I don't know if he was a men's health specialist or a fertility doctor or what exactly he was, but they called it triple mix. And what it was is the concentration of alprostadil, propaverin, and phentolamine. And essentially all of these cause vasodilation, roundabout ways or different ways, but they block receptors or cause influx in blood. And the combination of them is pretty potent, but you actually inject it directly into the um, into the penis on each side of the cavernosa and you get an erection that way. So it basically alters the way your penis is exchanging blood so that it increases blood flow. So this would actually cause an erection at the time of injection. There's a product on the market that I don't know if it still exists anymore, but it was called Muse and it was a urethral suppository. So it's a very small suppository with a long kind of attachment to it that you would actually put into the urethra and then it actually instructed, I remember my one of my intern colleagues and I were looking at this because we found it on our shelf in the back of the pharmacy. All these things that lurk in the back of pharmacies, you just never know what you're going to find. And we looked at the, the package insert and it showed how to do it. And basically, you're supposed to put it inside the urethra and roll the penis in between your hands until it melts to apply some heat to it. I don't know, or friction, who knows? It's a little bit odd, right? So that's an option too. Again, I think that a lot of this stuff is probably completely out of favor now that we have our very widely popular PDE5 inhibitors. So I assume that if you're treating somebody for erectile dysfunction, you're going to be starting with your PDE5 inhibitors. And then if that didn't work, you might try some of this stuff. But uh, certainly the PDE5 inhibitors are going to be way more convenient for anyone than any of this stuff, which is all a little bit strange, right? Okay, so enough about that. <laughs> Let's talk about male birth control. So uh, basically, as men, you know, very few options for birth control. You have vasectomy, which has... Um, not the greatest reversal rate. So the problem with vasectomy is it works great as a birth control option, but if you want to get it redone, um, it's about a 60% um, success rate for reversal. Condoms, lots of people will complain about them. You could have allergies to the products. You could find them uncomfortable or desensitizing, whatever it may be. People don't always like condoms. Um, and withdrawal method, which is, if you look back to the female birth control chart, has abysmal rates. <laughs> Um, and requires quite good timing, probably. So anyway, testosterone suppresses uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. So can we manipulate this somehow to suppress spermatogenesis? If you give enough testosterone, you will suppress these two hormones. But the problem is, if you think about um, a women's cycle versus a man's cycle, it's much more easy to manipulate one or possibly two eggs a month versus uh, hundreds of millions of sperm a month or a day even, I, mean, I can't remember exactly how much you make. I know it's a very, very large amount. So anyway, uh, it's very hard to shut down this process completely. And a couple other problems you don't have uh, with just testosterone alone, you'd likely have to give too much that would cause probably side effects that would be um, not desirable. And by not desirable, I mean significant effects in libido and other, other things like that. Um, you could maybe combine it with a progestin or a GnRH analog, possibly, but that just manipulates things more and puts you at risk for more side effects outside of that. And I know women are probably thinking, well, like birth control isn't free of side effects. It's certainly not, and that's one of the double standards I think apply to this. But I honestly think that there's not a good way to do this right now. I'll talk about some of the future options here that are interesting, but um, there's also no convenient long-acting oral option for testosterone. And other hormonal problems, you increase risk of BPH, decrease tes testicle size with um, some of this symptom, which is like, does that really matter? I don't know. Uh, but that would reverse theoretically if you stop taking the drug. Uh, a couple other options that are probably more realistic to see in the future. There's some vast difference occlusion methods or um, things kind of like that where you're basically mechanically blocking the flow of sperm. So you aren't really interfering with anything. You're just making sure that when a man ejaculates, no sperm gets into the ejaculate. There's a product called basal gel, which is in clinical trials right now. I think I can't remember how far along it is. Um, Epididymis theory or sperm maturation is another targeted um, approach to it. So if you could say, let's knock out the epididymis in general, the epididymis doesn't do anything really other than produce mature sperm. So if you could take it out, um, temporarily, then you could allow um, the continuous production of hormones. You don't have to manipulate anything, and there would actually be very few side effects. 
So there's a U of M, a group at the University of Minnesota and a couple other colleges, I think, working on this product, but um, something called, o, I think it's Albane or Obane toxin, which is associated with poisoned arrows. And so I think it's like a, I don't know if it's a um, poisoned dart frog type thing, but anyway, they found that it's possible uh, isolation of a part of the toxin decreases this sperm maturation process. And so that's an interesting compound that could, if made into a drug that has enough low enough number of side effects to get through FDA approval process could be a unique way to for men to take a, a medication that allows them to not mature sperm but doesn't really affect any other system so again kind of an interesting different way to approach it I think again the hormone system has been looked at and I don't know if we're ever going to get there there is a product that is was on the news recently if you and I think CNN had an article about it but it's a testosterone suppressing agent plus a synthetic androgen so the interesting thing is that this would suppress testosterone by basically medically castrating the man. However, you would give, it comes as a two drug combination pill. So the other drug is a selective synthetic androgen that would have androgen activity in other parts of the body, but would not affect sperm production. So it's like, again, it kind of goes back to this. It's hard to, to suppress the um, spermatogenesis completely with hormone manipulation without causing pretty devastating side effects. So if we can somehow supplement that so that you aren't having those side effects, well, that's an interesting way to do it. So that's another one. I think these two are the probably the two that I've read that are most far along as far as maybe some oral options for men, but certainly the mechanical things are interesting too. So I don't know. I think this is a totally untapped market, and I think there's a lot of drug companies that are probably clamoring to get their hands on something that would be uh, effective for males to take. It'd be a huge, I mean, if you had something that was pretty safe and effective, it would be a major blockbuster drug. So um, we'll see if something like that happens in the next few years, but I think we're still probably a few years out from seeing any real progress there. Okay, that's the last slide. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, test is next week. Uh, well, next, a week from Monday, I should say. And then uh, I'll have a small review thing posted as well shortly, but enjoy.